Welcome to the Working Audio Tools podcast, the home of all things mixing and mastering with myself, Ed Thorne, and my fellow co-host, Paul Third. This is the home of mix critique and comparisons, also where we interview industry professionals from the YouTube and audio communities. And this week we have a wicked guest who I've wanted to get on the show for a while because they've been very helpful to me personally in my studio development journey. And this is a great episode to follow on from Yesco, who we had on last week from Acoustics Insider. If you haven't checked out that episode, please do. It's in a playlist for season seven if you're watching on YouTube and is, of course, available on all the streaming platforms. To follow on from the Acoustics Insider episode, obviously, we had to talk about speakers. And there was only one man for this job that I could think of. This is someone who has personally visited my studio and helped me significantly with a recent purchase. More on that later. This person has visited, he estimates, over a thousand different studios and has pretty much tried every speaker in a lot of those studios. So this person has a lot of experience identifying what speakers work for who, where, why, and how. And we're going to be picking the brains today of Dale Chapman from SX Pro Audio. Dale, welcome. Thanks, Ed. Nice to see you. Likewise. So we had a wonderful day. Well, I enjoyed it. I don't know if you did. <laughs> at my studio where we were basically trying to problem solve some acoustic issues. And in a nutshell, it transpired, uh, which actually did corroborate my suspicions, that big woofer speakers weren't working in my room. They were creating too much energy and they weren't reading very well. I am, of course, talking about the PSIs that I had. This is well known on the channel. Everyone knows I had them. And then we also tried another brand that, who, that had similar sized woofers and they pretty much measured the same way. And then we tried a different brand of speaker and immediately they measured significantly better to the point where I was literally speechless. And that was your expertise bringing those in and suggesting that they might work. So as the man who knows speakers in different rooms, firstly, what, what are the fundamental mistakes people make when purchasing a speaker? Yeah, good question. Um, I think the beginning thing that I see from most people is is kind of um, being a victim of misinformation or confirmation bias, even because the the first thing you're going to do when you look for a piece a speaker, right, is is going to go online, see what people are using, what they like, and um, ask friends. You've got you know a, a circle of producer friends. A lot of my clients are you know on WhatsApp groups of all the, all the other guys that they're working with and things like that, and usually. If you get like uh, one or two people who are using a certain speaker, then they're immediately everyone else is going to want that speaker as well. That to me is a mistake because that doesn't necessarily mean that because they've got that speaker and they like it, maybe they're getting great results with it. Doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be the best thing for your room. I think that's you know the big mistake number one. There's a little bit of education I think people probably should take the time to do about how speakers work and how they interact with rooms. Um, so if you can just kind of spend a bit of time and, and and read into how speakers really work and how they, you know, wh why would you choose a certain kind of speaker? Like one of the things I've said to you before is, I think I said when I came around, you know, I get this phone call all the time. Hi, I'd like a pair of three-way speakers, please. I'm like, okay, cool. Yeah, wh why three-way? Silence. Like no <laughs> no one knows why they want a three-way, just that, that, that was told here or three is yeah. better than two or whatever it might be. That's not, a, you know, it, it's not a wrong thing to want by any means. There are reasons to want a three-way speaker specifically, but at least understand why you want it. You know, it's a bit like I uh, want a car with five wheels, please. Why? Uh, <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's better. Uh, it's just understand why you might want that and, and, and then make that choice. But ultimately, I think the car analogy is quite a good one because you're going to spend potentially a lot of money on a pair of speakers. Try it out. You know, you wouldn't just buy a car online and hope it works. You know, the best thing to do is get the speaker in your room and see what actually happens. Ideally, if you can measure it as well, just so you've got that confirmation that you know it's going to be great in your room. Um, I don't know, say, with the experience we had with you, and I, I, it's something I see a lot. When you put a fairly big speaker, you know, not enormous necessarily, but a fairly big speaker with a large woofer in a very small room, I see the result of this. I can walk into a room and I can like just hear the frequency response, I swear, because when you get a, a speaker like that, in a smaller room, you're going to get a huge buildup of low-end frequency, followed by a null, at the usually at the multiplication of that buildup frequency. It's like the opposite. It's, you know, mm. um, it's people call it SBIR. And it's also known as the Allison effect. And 
that is a nightmare thing to try and deal with with acoustics it's horrendously expensive and and unfortunately the only real, real way around it is to move rooms or treat it with something like a trinov which is you know arguably a sticking plaster for that kind of an issue there's loads of great things a trinov will do to, to fix other issues as well but it's not the you know quote unquote right way of doing it but uh, some you know in many cases obviously it's got to be recognized it's the only way and really it's probably the only practical way of, of treating that because acoustically trying to treat that in a really really small room is going to be heinously expensive so to you what are the advantages of advantages and disadvantages of a three-way and what are the advantages and disadvantages of a two-way um that's another great question and um probably longer than your podcast to answer that fully <laughs> <laughs> no worries. But the 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 fundamental nature of a speaker in theory let's forget reality for a minute in theory, you're going to want one driver because then you're going to have all the frequencies come from one place, all perfectly in phase, and you know even things like the reflections off the wall are going to happen at the same time, and and there's going to be way less you know, fundamental issues in the room. We all know that that can't be done because of the intermodulation issues you get when you're trying to produce 20 hertz and 10 kilohertz from one speaker. You it's like it's like moving a tweeter backwards and forwards. You know you see a woofer moving backwards and forwards when you're moving it high volume then that's where your tweet is going, and that's going to sound really weird and phasey. So that's why two ways exist. Um, so that the, you know, ideally with, technically speaking, as low a crossover as possible, in my opinion, because tweeters are so fast and responsive compared to woofers. So if you separate those drivers out, then you get rid of a lot of those intermodulation issues, and that's why we see so many two-way speakers today. The argument to have a three-way fundamentally comes from the uh, uh, you know further separating those intermodulation issues and getting more definition in the mid-range but also allowing for a higher SPL because if you put a tweeter crossover at let's say 1.2 kilohertz some of them are 1.8 kilohertz if you're getting to high volumes those tweeters the actual the drivers themselves are going to start getting hot and that's going to massively inhibit your ability to work if they melt which I have seen before literally a three-way monitor is literally splitting that workload up between those drivers Obviously, like all speaker designs, and we're going to touch on so many of this, I think, it's all a compromise. The, the downside of a 3 row monitor is you're having an extra crossover in there. You're moving the point source. You know, you're moving it away. You're, you're separating it. You know, you've got three woofers in a row. Those, those sounds, are, you know, all those frequencies are coming from three different places in the room, ultimately. And if you have, for example, horizontal speakers, not necessarily anything wrong with that, but it could be that you're mid-range and tweeter frequencies are going to be reflecting off of this wall over here before any of the base frequencies get there. And those are going to come back out of phase. And you can imagine, like, the, the maths on that starts getting crazy, which is mm. why it's so very, such a very difficult, tricky subject to kind of understand and also explain. But ultimately, it's one of those things where, to, to, if you're going to zip to the end of this conversation very quickly, it's going to, the sum up is to just try the speakers in your room and see if they get the results you, you, know, you need. But yeah, I mean, the two-way and three-way thing is a fantastic, uh, why four-way then, you know? <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, fundamentally, I bought the PSIs coming from the Neumann 120s of the two-ways because I was blown away by the expansiveness of the PSIs. And part of that, I've realized, was simply the frequency extension of a three-way versus a two-way. You know, as you said, a, a tweeter going from 3,600 hertz versus one going from 1800 hertz one can obviously go higher than the other it's just mm. you know maths and obviously bigger cones can go lower so you've, you've got a a broader frequency response and as you said more volume but i also find they deliver wider stereo imaging and argue arguably a stronger phantom center would you agree or disagree with that um that that's not necessarily true i think um okay. that that's a, a a case by case basis there's partly a room factor in that because you can have a great pair of speakers in a bad room and and miss that completely um you can have a pretty you know entry level pair of speakers in a really good room and still get a good phantom sensor so that that can be a thing so what you're probably experiencing i think it wasn't a two way versus three way thing it's more of a one speaker was working acoustically better in your room than the other Right. Let me ask something then, because sure. hmm. the closest I've got to three-way is the Kali IN5s, you know, which is a different unit, it's a coaxial. And obviously I've got the Kali LP8s with the sub, you know, which is still a three-way. Now, many people that I've spoken to in the industry have told me that 
the reason that they go for a three-way system is for translation. Why would it be that a lot of people I've spoken to have said that specifically to me, that they find that a three-way gives you better mixed translation? That's a really good question. Hmm. Um, why would a three-way give you better mixed translation? I, I, I would argue that it, they, that probably is just chance that they, that speaker works better in their room, genuinely. Yeah, yeah. There is no reason. Or maybe confirmation bias, let's be honest. <laughs> well, <laughs> it might just yeah, be that they've got a three I'm, way I'm, in as well. I'm famously finding the opposite, aren't I? Yeah. I'm getting better translation on With two way amps, yeah. than three way PSIs. But I couldn't say that about the Neumanns, though. So, yeah, I'm, I'm in touch with a lot of speaker designers. Okay. I, I work really closely. I've even consulted with a couple of brands on some of their products, which are out in the market now and doing very, very well. The truth of the matter is, I. I there are pros and cons to all speakers, right? That, that That's just, there, so many compromises have to be made in speaker design. It's unreal. And I can't imagine any of those speaker designers will actually say that a three-way is always better than a two-way. Um, that, you know, most speaker manufacturers offer both options. If they really believed in one over the other, I don't think they'd make both. Um, there are some manufacturers who stick by their guns for whatever reason, but I think, I can't think of one off the top of my head that, doesn't offer both. <laughs> yeah, true. I so, try to think of one that doesn't either. Yeah, I, I, think, I, mean, I think you're right in that my suggestion that three ways offer better phantom center than two ways is probably just my experience based because, uh, in my room because I think, as I said that, I was thinking, hang on a minute, I had the angry boxes from Tantrum Audio out wide and the phantom center's mega on those And that's things. just one single right. driver, eh? Yeah. Uh, yeah, so the phantom center, to be honest with you, is all about phase. Yep, Theoretically, totally. a two-way should be better than a three-way. Mm. Yeah, it's correct. You know, yeah. I, I, I mean, don't get me wrong. If you make a really good three-way with really good crossovers and incredibly accurate phase response, like the, I see a lot of speakers on the market now where the drivers are not actually time-aligned. Like the, the tweeter it's and crazy, the mid-range yeah. information is leaving the, the, the wave front of the speaker before the woofer, because woofers are inherently slow you know, compared to a tweeter. It's so much quicker for a tweeter to move that fraction of a, a, you know, a, a millimetre to produce the sound it needs to make than a woofer to move, you know, up to an inch sometimes or whatever it might be, sometimes more, I guess. And that brings us back to last week, Ed, because you remember, we, not it was a debate, but um, Yesco was saying that he uses the linearizer function on the head type 20s all the time for that purpose. And you were under the assumption that, you know, most modern manufacturers would be time aligning the drivers. But I, I, yeah. have you found that to be, I'm not going to ask you which brands, obviously, but you've have you found that quite a lot, Dale, that, there are certain brands out there that don't actually do that good a job in time aligning the drivers. It amazes me the speakers people buy sometimes because right, okay. there are a lot of products out there that are actually out of phase with themselves. Analog speakers generally suffer from that most because, you know, electronically time aligning with DSP is a lot easier to do. But you can mechanically time align. You can, you know, you look for, for products with the tweeter is set back inside the cabinet a little bit with usually a waveguide. Um, those ones generally are going to be a little bit more accurate with the face in that respect i mean bear in mind everything i'm saying with this sort of stuff is very generalized because there are so many exceptions to this stuff you know it's that's why i wouldn't we want to point out specific brands or anything like that for doing anything particularly good or not so good because it's so um there's a lot of subjectivity but also uh every, everything i say there's going to be a, an, an exception out there for sure so so how would you know for the listeners out there how would you know if I mean, I take it, Dale, you've listened to that many speakers that can you tell if a speaker's not been well time aligned? Yeah, I mean, when it comes to checking the the, the phase on a pair of speakers, yeah, as long as you've got a acoustically good room, ideally symmetrically left and right, you don't have a window on your right you know, and just a really well treated wall on the left, you know. If your room is fairly symmetrical and you, it's kind of well treated or fairly dead, then you are going to be able to set up a pair of speakers and you should hear that, you know, your vocal perhaps right in the middle is, you know, literally right in the middle. I use the the, uh, the, the track Adele Hello because the, the vocal in that is so well recorded and there's not, like certainly at the beginning of the track, there's not a lot of distraction. That track I stick on and if I hear and it sounds like Adele is right in front of me, then the phase is very, very strong. You know, ideally, right, if it okay. sounds quite solid and full, if it sounds really thin and harsh, then it's probably going to be weird. But bearing in mind, you've got to measure your speaker distances as well. And this is actually kudos to Ed for this because he actually did measure the distance between his speakers and, and his listening position and get that stuff right. 
So if your one speaker is like a centimeter back from the other, that's like, well, if you look at every every frequency that is under a centimeter long, those are going to be massively affected by that speaker being, you know, a, a centimeter further away from mm. you. So just make sure they are, bearing in mind, you know, you're going to move left and right a bit, aren't you? But start at least with them both the same distance from your listening position. But yeah, there, there isn't really like a huge sonic signature or a particular sound of a speaker that makes you go, oh, that's horribly out of phase. But a smeariness in that center, like if the, the, the smaller that center sounds, the more accurate your phase is. Sure. And what about poorly designed crossovers? Because I feel that's something that I've heard in certain lower budget speakers. But I and and especially with the two ways, say like the PreSonus Eris range, I always hear this distortion or coloured sound in the in the upper mid range and the tops. Can you actually hear a poorly designed crossover, or is there just other elements like you know distortion? Like the tweeter is just overly distorting. If if it's bad, you know, you're going to have horrendous phase issues there, and. Yeah. You, you you'll see that if you measure if you're lucky enough to measure with something like a Trinov, you you'll be able to just see that happening um but uh it's going to be tricky to mix in that area as well I mean, it's not like it necessarily presents itself as a horrendous distortion or anything like that um but like you'll get unexpected and and unwanted artifacts of you know while you're mixing it's going to kind of present itself in a what's really going on there, I can't really tell. So and bearing in mind, if a, if a crossover is designed really well, as you take a sine wave, for example, and this is very difficult to hear, but what theoretically should happen is if you go from a woofer and pass that through the sine wave through the crossover region into the mid-range, you should actually theoretically, if you imagine the woofer's here and the mid-range is here and the sweeter's here, you should theoretically hear that move up. Whereas actually a poorly designed crossover, it will just dip and then suddenly come out yeah, of the yeah. other speaker more. So, and then it can present itself in, again, so many different ways because a poorly designed crossover doesn't necessarily mean you can't hear it. It could, there's all sorts of things that could happen. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, is, it won't necessarily dip, it'll boost, won't it? As they, um, uh, as course, they signals add up. Th- that's, yeah, absolutely. I mean, if th- that's just a poorly designed speaker rather than a crossover because you, you, or, you know, if you've got two drivers producing the same frequency and there's a boost, then the, the manufacturer hasn't taken into account that, that they haven't done their maths properly. You know, that you'd want to move the crossover up. Generally speaking, when you get, and this is going to get really nerdy and scientific because some people I'm sure will love it, but when, you, when you're choosing a mid-range driver for your product, if it's an off-the-shelf from CS or wherever it might be, you get given a like a frequency response chart. And the very low end and very high end of that driver is going to show itself as all sorts of crazy distortion and frequencies you're not going to want. You're not going to look at that and go, yes, I want that in my driver, thank you. You're going to choose to filter it inside the range where that that frequency response is, is more suited to your speaker, ideally flat. And if you're not filtering within that range, you're going to get all sorts of horrible results. You know, you'd be insane to even be a speaker manufacturer if you didn't consider that correctly. And to be fair, you know, these guys, pretty much all of them know what they're doing. But I do find it kind of strange that some manufacturers make the choices they do. But then everything in speaker design, as I mentioned, is a compromise. I think a lot of the target that speaker manufacturers set for themselves is based around the the end price that the person is going to pay. That unfortunately dictates almost everything. You know, if money was no object, they, you know, you can you can get some good speakers for crazy money. You know, ten thousand pound plus, whatever it might be, hundred thousand pound plus, if you really want to go that far, and you know. Whether it's worth that to some people is another thing, but like if you're Paul Ashmore and you have that PMC setup, <laughs> yeah, I mean that that was just more because it was a lot of speakers. Um, yeah, you know those speakers individually, the ones he's got in his wall are like five grand a pop or something. Right. Okay. Um, so it, it's not the craziest, most expensive, you know, hi-fi setup that you could imagine, but that's a, a big Atmos setup he's got there. So yeah, it adds up. Sadly, Atmos is not cheap to do well. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> DistroKids sponsors the Working Audio Tools podcast and 30% off your first year subscription can be found in the podcast show notes and the YouTube video description. Hyperfollow is the easiest way to place all of your content in one single place, making finding all of your content super easy for your audience. Upload artwork for your release, edit the information and apply links to all of the streaming platforms your music is going to be available, which of course on DistroKid is potentially all of them that exist now and even in the future. Add social media buttons so your audience can find you and your latest music video. 
Creating a beautiful landing page with a preview of your music is easy with Hyperfollow. Hyperfollow links can be created for all of your releases and it enables you to create pre-save links for your audience to pre-order your music before it's released. This link is shareable on all of your platforms and a great way to promote your next release only with DistroKid. So what are the advantages and disadvantages of the various different speaker designs, the cabinet designs, for example, closed cabinet design, front ported, rear ported, transmission line, passive radiators, and other suggestions you might have? As I've mentioned, and I will continue to mention, um, all speaker design is a massive compromise. So if, if you do some reading on this stuff, it's quite nerdy and, and interesting, but you know, you, you see your soffit mount speakers, that's the kind of infinite baffle thing. It's like there's not a cabinet. It's just a wall. And that gives you the most efficient bass response from the speaker. It makes the most use of that woofer. So if you ever want to get more low end, it's the same thing. You know, if you take your speaker and move it closer to the wall, you get the boost in low end. Yeah. And that keeps going when you put it into the wall. But it kind of flattens out, um, generally speaking. So, yeah, I mean, the, the, the sealed design is, is a very good one. And it's a really interesting one for me because what you get there is with the cabinet being sealed, if you imagine the woofer moving backwards and forwards in the cabinet, as it moves out of the cabinet, it creates a vacuum inside the cabinet, which then pulls the speaker back to, to the zero position ultimately. And obviously, if it goes into the cabinet, the air, the air pressure builds up inside and tries to push it back to the zero thing. Why is that important? Well, this is, this is actually I find fascinating. If you imagine like a kick drum and a very, very low kick drum, like a sub or something, and it's just going to go boom, right? You want that speaker if it's an accurate one, to just move and then immediately stop. What actually happens in real life is that driver has got its own weight, its own mass. So when it gets propelled by the magnet and the, in, and the amplifier, it's actually going boom and takes a, you know, it takes a moment to right itself back to the zero position. A sealed cabinet, because of the air pressures inside it, help it back to that zero position as quickly as possible. And that creates a tighter sound, a more accurate sound ultimately, because if that driver is moving when it's not being driven by sound from your audio, it's creating sound that doesn't exist in your mix. You can imagine how important that is, you know, yeah, yeah. and, and mm -hmm. this is where a ported speaker will fall down a bit because it doesn't have the air pressure to help it along. And generally, you hear, you know, the difference with a ported speaker is it has a, a warmer, fatter, deeper low end, but that's actually being created by the woofer moving when it shouldn't. And so ultimately, you're hearing something in your mix that shouldn't be there. Now, again, generalization, but a lot of speaker manufacturers deal with this in different ways. You can have a, a high damping factor in your amplifier, and that is literally the amplifier working to stop the woofer when it's producing you know, uh, electricity back into the amplifier by moving from its own inertia. So another manufacturers do it with some DSP as well. They you know, use the DSP to create the damping factor. Swings around about us, but obviously the benefit of having a ported speaker, you know, why do they exist then? If there's this problem, why do they exist? Well, sealed cabinets can be inhibited by volume because once you start pushing that woofer out of the cabinet too much, the air pressure gets so great and you'll get distortion. So you rarely see, for example, a big pair of main monitors that are sealed. It's rare. I don't think there are any on the market. High volume speakers at a sealed, and sealed cabinets don't go together oh, that's well. That's interesting. So the, the, the ported cabinet design is the way around that. Now, that's not to say ported cabinets are bad are capable to go, you know, a lot louder. There's pretty much no limit on on the volume that they are capable of. The the kind of the only drawbacks really of of the ported design are a slightly higher step response. It's called essentially how quickly the the, the woofer stops when it when it should stop. But also um, you and you can test this if you've got any ported speakers or if any of your listeners have got ported speakers. You can test how good they are by running a sine wave, ideally fairly loud through them, not loud enough to blow your speakers up, please don't do that, but if you run a sine wave through and, and sweep up and down, ideally under 100 hertz, down to probably 20, 30, at some point you'll hit a resonant frequency and you'll yeah. get kind of a sound along with the sine wave. And is that what the port is tuned to? Because I've read that quite a lot when people talk about the port being tuned. Oh, I can't that's remember if that's actually... Frequency. Yeah, the ports are tuned usually. Yeah, they because are, they? yeah. If you, if you measure a, 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 a ported speaker, you'll get a... Usually a little lump, like a bump a in the low end, and then, then quite a steep... Yeah, exactly the, that. The, the, the ports the, the, are tuned to the harmonics often, aren't they, to avoid the most influential ones, such as the third. So people often use the fifth, I believe. Is there are, roughly again, 
big generalization. There are loads of different ways to deal with it, right. but th- th- quite often they use it to to deepen the bass response of the speaker as well. Like, because you can tune it to be just below where the lone cutoff of, mm. of the woofer is and, and essentially artificially deepen that bass response with, with low end that comes out of the port, essentially. Yeah, my um, experience of ported speakers are they tend to be, I want to use the word richer in the low end, and I'm aware that is the mm. harmonic generation that's making you feel that. Yeah, and I think one and that can reason, be quite a pleasing sound, right? It can yeah. be. It's, it's very pleasing, and it's also a bit deceiving, and that's one reason I think the PSIs don't work for me is because even though I had all this low end in the room, I was taking mixes elsewhere, and they would sound a bit anemic. And I'm thinking I'm getting so much richness in the low end that it sounds great for me, but it's not what people are getting when they're not getting their mm-hmm. harmonics-inducing ports on the speakers in their car sure. or in their headphones. And that's why you want clean low end. That's why, like, even when um, Present Day Production was talking about it, they were talking about the mums and they were saying that they tried to get um, a speaker, well, a low driver that had the lowest distortion possible because when you have the lowest distortion possible then the low end that you are hearing is actually correct and it theoretically should give you the best translation in the low end but as Dale said the issue that we have a lot is that some some manufacturers and this goes for many things even headphone amps as well Rupert Neve headphone amp being one where it's actually quite coloured in the low end but many people will listen to that and go I really like it because it's musical, you know what I mean? It's mm. rich. and But well, as talking from a mixing engineer perspective, especially mastering as well, you theoretically do want the lowest like distortion and the low end possible. And from what I found, you, this is where you start to get into the, the brackets of higher price speakers. And that is, does kind of start to get into the point where you do kind of get what you pay for. Like I understand that, you know, if I go for Carly's, I understand that they have... Um, higher distortion compared to, you know, f- your upper end focals and your amphians and stuff like that. So th- there is a lot of things that people do tend to get a little bit tricked by where they think that b- because they like a certain sound, they think that that's suitable for mixing. And I think that's why it's important that we have you on, Dale, is to kind of talk about, you know, what is important from an audiophile aspect, which has a market, but what's very important from a mixing aspect, which is what Ed has found with the PSIs. Now, Ed, have you found that the low end and the Amphians is a lot cleaner and a lot less richer compared to, say, the PSIs, especially the new the new Amphians that you've got on? Yes, definitely less harmonic content, for sure. I need to spend more time on them. Certainly the 212, the 218s that uh, I have just bought from Dale. Um, <laughs> Yeah, they're also producing something different on the desk, which I need to get used to, and I'm still figuring out the crossover point because I am running them with the PSI subwoofer, um, and I can't decide on a on a crossover point. I think I've got it, but I need to test what translates at this point, um, so I can't quite answer that question yet. And what I find funny about speakers a lot of times is that lots of people, when they hear clean, they don't like it. They think it's so sterile. And yes, yes. I'm glad and you mentioned that. And, and this is it's a really interesting one um, because uh, flat isn't fun. I think <laughs> is, is is like a, a nice catchphrase. It's it's, yeah. it's rarely a pleasing sound. Um, I would say that uh, it's a good thing to get used to. Um, but if if you can train your ear to just deal with that and and live with it, then it, you you will do very very well. But Let's face it. I mean, even I like I I would do a trin of measurement, get my speakers ruler flat, and then you know enhance the low end a little bit just to warm it up. <laughs> um, and that's personally because you know I I don't do a great deal of very critical mixing. I, I you know I, I keep my toe in the water. Let's say I have to, but this is something that you know if if I'm dealing with a producer who's likely to. You know, he's not critically mixing, and I, you know my, the people I do with are all sorts of hobbyists and all sorts. You name it. But if it's a producer and they're, you know, they're just not, they're not critically mixing. They're just, you know, creating the audio in the room with the artist, and they're going to have a bit of a vibe to that. They don't want to be dealing with sealed speakers distorting at higher volumes and stuff. They want to feel the music a bit and that kind of thing. Ported pair of speakers is probably ideal for that. You know, it's less critical in that respect. Obviously, the conversation we're having, I think, is probably leaning towards the more critical listening and mixing side yeah, of things. Yeah. And that's where things do get more complicated. You know, producing side of things is great to have great speakers, don't get me wrong, but it's less important because it's not really impacting on the final result. 
you want to create the vibe and, and the feel in the room and, and, and ideally enjoy the process, right? It's almost, you know, what, what they've been used for critical listening and analytical mixing or impressing clients, artists and A&R guys. And you're yeah. probably going to you're probably going to switch between different speakers. Exactly that. And this is why if you go to, um, you know, the more traditional studio, you'll have the near fields and then main monitors usually in the wall and that kind of thing. Those big main monitors almost always these days are used to impress the A&R guys who are coming around who are just checking out the track to hear them, you know. And those are great speakers to, to produce on as well. Um, but if you're critically mixing, you know, uh, a, a good, accurate pair of near... Why do you think NS10s have been so <laughs> ubiquitous yeah. for so long? You know, they, they do a really good job. So it, they, they, they tick a lot of boxes. They're just not that pretty to listen to. And there's no reason, really, you couldn't have that kind of accuracy and also them sound pretty good. You know, that, that, that can be done. So can we pick up from the cabinet design and go, and go back to the transmission line? Because I'm interested to hear how that is so revered by one particular brand. Or it's almost as if they own the patent for that design. Maybe they do. <laughs> no, um, they don't. I, right. So, so, so I can't think of many other brands that, that push that. But I mean, that they this brand, well, it's PMC, isn't it? Everyone knows who we're talking about. In my opinion, have the best low end on any speaker out there. Yeah, I agree. And agreed. every PMC Crofts heard has just been the tightest, punchiest low end, yeah. almost to the point where it's impressive. And I strayed away from them because I thought, well, that's just going to make everything I do sound great. <laughs> I don't I want it to sound <laughs> honest, Serious. not great. But actually, I'm now thinking of entertaining them again. No, no, totally. No, there, there, there's lots to be said for it. So all of these speaker designs, the cabinet designs we're talking about, were kind of all theorised in the very early days of speaker design. I think it's like the 20s, 1920s or so. Hey, yeah, it's the 20s now, isn't it? It's the <laughs> 1920s we need to be thinking about. So yeah, a good long time ago, a lot of these things came around. Even Transmission Line was theorised around then, if I recall correctly. And um, the, the, the idea of it is that you can have all the benefits of a ported speaker w- without the downsides. So the downsides being, as I mentioned earlier, of a ported cabinet, you get uh, an uneven bass response on the low end. There's often a, a lump around that resonant frequency, but also the kind of port chuff that represents actually kind of a low mid-range distortion. And the, again, it's a compromise. The way around that is to tune that, well, the transmission line ultimately, you know, the port, extend the port to a length. It, it, basically, the way it's calculated, I mean, PMC's, pattern i think it is is advanced transmission line it's not just transmission line they call it advanced transmission line atl and what technically happens out of that is that the port behind the the woofer is calculated to be long enough so that what comes out of the end of it is essentially a quarter of the wavelength of what the driver's producing Mm. and that um, transmission line is also heavily acoustically treated so what happens is you get essentially like a passive subwoofer out of that that port that's tuned and also distortion free now what's the compromise then cost <laughs> is the answer yeah. pmcs totally. are quite pricey and that is because they cost a lot more to make those cabinets it's a much more complex design and build cabinets are horrendously difficult to build and, and finally just for my interest having just bought another set of speakers with passive radiators what are the advantages or disadvantages for those um, so the, the passive radiator is another workaround to the problem that sealed cabinets have of essentially distorting at a higher volume and also um, have the happy benefit of deepening the bass response as well. So if you imagine, I was saying earlier about the, 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 the sealed cabinet suffering when the, when the driver's moving too much and it, it starts distorting because it's fighting against the vacuum created by the cabinet. Well, if part of that cabinet is able to sympathetically move with it, Mm. then it mm-hmm. changes the internal volume of the cabinet, you know, uh, dynamically, essentially, while while the drivers are moving. So the, again, there's always a compromise. The downside of that is those sympathetic passive radiators are going to slow down the bass response slightly. So with, for example, Amphion, you can kind of get the best of both worlds. This is where it can be a bad design or a good design. Amphion have designed theirs in a way that if you... Uh, are you know essentially running low frequencies through them they still maintain the sonic signature you'd expect from a sealed cabinet they don't feel lumpy or slow or you know and i I, do you remember the focal sm9 yep 
So that had a huge passive radiator on the top of it. Um, and I personally wasn't a fan of that. I think they're, the trios that they've made now are just outstanding speakers. But the SM9 always had like just the most lumpy, slow bass response, in my opinion. Yeah, I had the Focal Ships X-T5s, and they've got the, the passive radiators on the side. Yeah, I think small passive radiators work quite well because they're you know they're not going to be quite so slow to stop. But I think it was like a ten or twelve inch radiator on the SM9. Wow, Jesus Christ! It was like a dustbin lid. It was huge. <laughs> and and I, I, honestly, I'm. It was a funny moment. I think we had a, a stuffed toy in the studio I was working on once that was sat on top of the SM9s. And have you have done it. Have you ever had that the moment where you full scale the pair of speakers? Yeah, something comes through and it's just you know bypassed the <laughs> level control or something like that. The stuffed toy hit the ceiling. <laughs> it's just shot up from the, wow. the whip. Yeah, I, I did it early days, yeah. Now, why is it that passive radiators will, well, I, I say no, I can't say always, right? But for Ed, they measured, again, the null was nowhere near as big as, say, the PSIs. And when I had the Focal Shape 65s in here, I had them in the exact same position as the Carly's. And they did, honestly, I was like a, I want to say a six to seven dB null about. 80 hertz in the Carly's and the focal shapes in the exact same position measured like, I think it was minus, I think it was a dB null. There was like 6 dB of a difference in the null and they were in the exact same position. So what is it from an acoustical point of view that passive radiators can actually give you a benefit? It's all to do with how bass radiates. So you may, I mean, you probably do know, I'm sure you do. Um, a lot of people don't. It's fascinating. And I didn't learn this, and you know, yeah. you learn over the period of time don't you we're always on this learning journey together aren't we while we're doing the podcast exactly yeah and this, uh, this is I'm, I'm so glad to be on because i think actually this kind of thing needs to happen more so good good on you guys with uh base radiation everything kind of under 200 hertz becomes gradually more omnidirectional so yeah, you know the lowest low frequencies you really cut like so you can get away with a subwoofer like off center in the room and things like that and you wouldn't necessarily hear it as being off center um, apart from perhaps amplitude, but bass radiates omnidirectionally from every speaker. If you were playing a 50 hertz sine wave and you stand behind it, it's not necessarily any quieter. It, it might be based on your room acoustics, but if you did this in an anechoic chamber, it will radiate really evenly because it goes through the cabinet. It's not just directional like tweeters are, which get absorbed by the simplest of materials, which is why even things like foam on the wall you know, will absorb tweeters, um, you know, frequencies, but not bass frequencies. So... Basically, to, I'm going around the houses here, but the, the quick answer to your question there, Paul, is the way that these speakers radiate bass based on their, their cabinet design is going to change. You know, and, and there are going to be different resonances. They're going to affect the room in different ways. And also, if you think about it, even just small things like uh, the positioning. So, for example, um, with Ed, with his, with his, I think it was with PSIs, the bass cabinets are going to be at a certain point in the room. And with the Amphions, those, 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 so the bass drivers are going to be in a different place in the room and, and responding differently and perhaps activating different um, you know, room modes and things like that. So I think for Ed's particular room, you know, the PSIs may not have worked. I've heard them sound amazing in other rooms. I think they, they really complement just really, really good rooms well. With smaller rooms, you need a more forgiving speaker in that respect. And, and let's face it, I think the Amphions don't produce as much deep, rich, low end as the PSIs do. Um, but this is where Ed's kind of complementing that with the sub and filling that low end out and using the trin off to make sure everything stays balanced and tuned, you know? And I suppose that needs to bring us back to, well, really move us forward to what most people will want to hear is how do you find the best speaker for your room? And I think the Ed's journey with yourself has showcased the importance of, you know, finding the speaker that works for your room and understanding the size of your room and how a certain speaker can correlate to that room and how it can work. Great question. I think the first thing, when people ring up and go, I'm interested in a pair of speakers, I'm going to say, okay, like, well, look, what, what are you working on? What kind of music are you doing? What are your needs? Are you a mix engineer? Are you mastering? Are you producing? And that kind of thing. Because immediately that's going to categorize the kind of speaker I'm going to possibly recommend. After that, I'm going to say, like, what, what's the room like? You know, have you measured it? Is it big? Is it, give me an idea of the size. Like Ed, for example, he told me what roughly his room dimensions are. And I'm like, okay, I kind of already got an idea of the problems I'm going to be facing. because that. And then I just... sent you photos and your reaction was uh, <laughs> quite comical. <laughs> oh, no, it, it, it was a challenge because you obviously, the, the, the issue with your room, Ed, it was that, that you were going to be really limited in positioning. 
because yeah. you didn't have tons mm. of space around the desk to do that. So that was going to limit how much we could do with it. But I mean, this is the kind of thing, again, I'll, I'll, if I'm speaking to someone over the phone or whatever it might be, I'm going to try and determine what my challenges are in, you know, I, I, I'm not going to bring a massive pair of speakers to Ed Studio. It's going to be silly. Now, I do get asked, you know, can you have a speaker that's too big for your room? You kind of yes and no. It's it's really kind of room dependent. If you if you're a producer and you just want to have really pump out high volume, you're going to have a big speaker, um, and just forego the fact that you're probably not going to have the most accurate results in there if you're going to critically mix. But it's it, it, ultimately you need to just assess what your needs are. You know, what what are my priorities here? If I just want really good phase, and this is the thing actually, I think manufacturers are really guilty of, and I'll challenge them all here now verbally. Please give us more information about the phase response of your speakers because. Yeah, you could um, we see, I, I've asked people this in the past and gone, okay, you're choosing a pair of speakers. What's the first thing you look at? Like what specification are you going to look at? And almost all people say frequency response. Yeah. yeah. I want to know how low they go. <laughs> well, that's great. And it's nice to know, but let's, let's face it. I think every speaker on the market kind of says that they're flat from this frequency to that frequency, but and that's an the coach chamber. chamber. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's not real world. So the truth of the matter is, is once we find out the needs you know, what your needs are, it's going to be a case of, okay, well, a painful question, but what's your budget? You know, how far do you want to go with this? Um, you do get what you pay for. I can't stress that enough. The, the, the music industry is so competitive. The manufacturers are so competitive, they can't afford to overprice their products because another manufacturer is going to make a, as good a product for, yeah. you know, the correct price, let's call it. So th- there are weird price packets with speakers where, you know, if someone says that, that they've got a budget of, one thousand five hundred pounds. I'm going to meet different challenges than if they go. I've got ten thousand pound budget. You know, my job gets a lot easier if, if their price is higher because suddenly I've got a lot more range to choose from that might work. And it's not necessarily a case of buying the most expensive speaker. It's a case of if you've got the budget to have some options, then I can bring some options to your room. And this is the main thing, right? Get the speakers in your room. Never, ever, ever, ever just buy a speaker based on what you've heard in a shop or at a friend's place. Like even if you trust the studio or anything, doesn't matter put it in your room because that's yep. the only place in the whole or world a trade it festival. Yeah. I mean, by all means, you can not get an room. idea. Yeah. You, you can get a vibe. <laughs> you can get a feel in these places. That's great. But the only place in the whole world, it matters that that speaker sound is in your room. So, if, you know, if you speak to your dealer or, or borrow speakers off a friend, if you're buying them on reverb, reverb or whatever, get the speakers in your room and then then spend the money. Yeah. Because that, that, that's the, absolutely the, the key thing. And obviously in the buying process, you're going to want to ideally measure the speakers for peace of mind and make sure they're, they're behaving in a good way. So like we did with you, Ed, we, we could see the measurements in the room were kind of wild and the trainer was having to work quite hard. That's less than ideal. You know, it certainly works, but it's, it's the ideal thing would be to have the trainer off doing as little as possible and just really tidying things up. The less it has to do, the better things are. Yeah. And the difference between former brand of speakers and current brand of speakers was remarkable and I was just about to pull the trigger on a rather expensive desk to replace the one I've got to buy me more um, flexibility with positioning and heights etc but the Amphion 218s just read infinitely better didn't they Mm. particularly particularly above 200 hertz and I was suspecting the desk of causing a lot of those problems but the Amphions in this MTM mid tweeter mid format seem largely impervious to desk reflections. I mean, I can hear them. Uh, Top tip for everyone, (laughs) if you've got a flat surface on your desk and you've got a controller like the SSL Logic UF8, angle it, use the feet, and you would be amazed how much that clears up the low mids on your desk. But the the combination of that and the MTM format and the Amphions basically meant that, I mean, I I could get a new desk, but for the money, there was going to be no benefit really, was Mm. there? Well, I mean, just some different layout probably and um, perhaps introducing some slightly different, you know, sonic changes to your room. But in the fairness of balance, right, they could easily work the other way. You know, there, there are rooms I will go to that you know might have a particular speaker and, and the PSIs would be the best one in there. You know, it, it's really, I haven't got the formula down there, let's put it that way. It's an ongoing um, study, but it's, um, I, 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 Got generally got a good vibe about when I'm walking into a room as to what speaker might be a good one in there. Um, but usually when I'm, I'm, I'm talking to people about these things, I'd like to try and mitigate any potential issues because there are things like 
I've been to studios where, for some reason, the speaker on the left side has got like a 20 dB null at 30 hertz or 40 hertz or something. And that is horrendously yeah. difficult to try and fix, almost impossible. Yeah. So, like, we need to go, like, well, the, the speaker, that, that either that speaker is a problem in here, and sometimes you can bung another speaker in and it just resolved, like it happened with you. It's just like, okay, well, that ha- happens to just measure really, really well. Or we play around with room placement. And that's why I kind of chuckled when I saw Euromed because placement was going to be very limited as to how, how far <laughs> yeah. we go with that. It yeah. kind of just got here. the desk and that's and it. And it goes yeah. forward or back or side of it. It does not go up or down. Yeah. But those, you know, still worth playing with those those movements and, and ideally getting Massively. the flat response as much as mm. you can. Yeah. Yeah. Hey there, Ed here. You may recognise my voice from doing all the other Distro Kid advert segments. At this time, I didn't want to just do a typical advert talking about stuff to do with Distro Kid. I actually wanted to give you my feedback about the service because I genuinely do use Distro Kid for uploading my music. And I know Paul does, and it turns out Dan Worrell does as well. I've used Distro Kid since 2019. As you can see on the screen, I have six releases so far. It is genuinely super easy to use. The tracks get into Spotify within 24 hours, which is remarkable. Apple Music takes a little bit longer. I'd suggest giving that 10 to 14 days. The hyperfollow links are really useful for advanced promotion of your tracks. And the promo cards are really great visual aids for social media promotion. Ooh, I particularly like that one. DistroKid collect all the royalties from your streaming services. And here you can find an itemized breakdown of where all your income has come from. There is also a DistroKid referral where you can save your friends $10 per sign-up by creating your own VIP referral link. One of the big killers I see in studios, and this is enormous, are the curved screens. Um, they literally work like a radar dish to direct high-frequency content in all the wrong places. Um, I would always suggest like not having a curved screen and you know trying to keep it away as, from the speakers as far as possible. Those are just killer. Like they, they measure so strongly on a on a frequency response chart, it's insane. And with a flat Never screen, seen... do you reckon? A, do you recommend as far behind the speaker as possible? Uh, that that can vary, depend on the room. Again, like yeah. it, it's it's one of those things where ideally, probably behind the speaker as far as you can is is probably good because it's just keeping it away from them. But it's again measure and make the decision can to it. try things and just move it around and, and this, that way you can't get stuff wrong. You know, if if you're able to just measure. And bear in mind, like Rumi Q Wizard is free. Um, yeah. It's not the most penetrable software in the world to get going yeah. with. I've never used it before, but yeah. I'm sure someone's done a YouTube tutorial somewhere. But just like doing some measurements and just using that as a sanity guide to see if a change you make is better or worse is insanity is guide. Ruse is a rabbit hole. I wish I'd never gone oh, there. Oh, God. <laughs> I've lost weeks of my life due, due to Rumi Q Wizard. It's not even funny. I'm like 17 mixes behind because I discovered Rumi Q Wizard. <laughs> oh, gosh. No, painful. Ultimately, I think like cabinet design obviously plays a big part in, in speakers and you've got your woofer sizes, you know, crossovers. Uh, DSP versus non-DSP is a thing I get asked a lot as well. Ah, let's go down that rabbit hole because that's fun. <laughs> can do that if you want. I, I, th- I've, I think in my experience... My initial reaction a year and a bit ago when I was doing my speaker journey was I was hearing the difference between analog and DSP-based, DSP-controlled speakers. There were one or two brands, which I still think this is the case, but I think it's brand-specific rather than technology-specific. They sounded shallower. Well, they weren't as deep as some of the analog counterparts, but then... I will also say I don't think the Amphion sound as deep as the PSIs. Um, maybe that's a two-way to versus three-way thing more than an MTM passive versus digital thing. Because there's some digital speakers that are, that sound ridiculously deep, like the head type 20s have one of the best depths I think I've heard. Other DSP speakers can sound a little shallow, particularly at one kilohertz. So yeah, I'm basically saying that it's so, everything is so brand and room dependent. As they always keep saying, get get the speakers in your room. Yeah, that that is, this is the number one rule when it, when it comes to buying speakers is, is to put them in your room, um, regardless of their features or you know DSP or whatever it might be. But the the thing you're saying about hearing the head type twenty being the deepest sounding speaker you, you you have heard, and that's a one of you know probably a fair comment. Yeah, genuinely, and this is not about the heads, but every speaker, uh, all these demos I've done, you know, hundreds or possibly thousands, I've heard every pair of speakers you can imagine sound utterly awful. And also incredible. There are speakers I don't like that, and that's just a personal tasting. 
But there are speakers that I don't like, and I've gone into rooms and gone, oh, my God, they're amazing. You know, they what? And then the next day I could do another demo with the same pair, of, literally the same pair of speakers in another room, and they are like, mm, it's awful. And, and, and I've heard every pair of speakers, as I say, in, in both cases and everywhere in between. So it, it is about the room. It's everything about yeah. the room or positioning and room correction if you need it. This is the problem I think people have is because it is a minefield, and I think it's too easy to fall into the trap of just believing someone online. Like, I mean, I've seen customers come to me kind of saying, oh, you know, we'll sort over gear space or something like that, that, you know, mm. this is the thing to buy. But who are those people? Like, yeah. what's their qualifications? You know, how can you trust their opinion that they're just a username on a forum? Some people, obviously, are, are more open about who they are, but it's also that person's opinion might not apply in your situation. They haven't been in your room. Mm-hmm. They haven't got your workflow they haven't got your needs they've got different needs so so just because they say it's a great speaker and it's got a particular feature that maybe you're looking for doesn't stop you trying that pair of speakers in your room and, and seeing if it works mm-hmm. translation as as me and ed have found and as everybody finds when you get into mixing translation is so unbelievably personal that you know you could genuinely have a great room and a great pair of speakers that really work for them but they just don't resonate with the way that you mix and the way that you hear music and you choose another pair of speakers in another room and the person who mixed on that are like, no, I hate it, but your translation works and that's all that matters in this game is translation. If your clients are happy and that same sound resonates through all the different other monitors out there, then that's the one that you go for and that's all that should matter. All this yeah. bollocks about, yeah, it sounds like this and I get a little bit of this and a little bit of that. It's, it, our job as mixing engineers is just to make sure that what the sound that we hear in here translates out there. Totally it's agree. Kind of as and and as this that. is the thing, like when, when, when looking at a pair of monitors is, is that, yes, it's nice if you can enjoy the sound in your studio, but let's not forget, these are tools. Like we're not here to, it's not meant to be like a game or anything like these are work, like it's a pair of, you know, it's a set of spanners that a mechanic might have. Yeah. These are tools. They are there to get us the result we're looking for. So while it's lovely to have the idea that you're going to have this wonderful sound in your studio, I would rather have a studio that sounds kind of, you know, if I get a mix and I, I'm able to just accurately hear everything and make good, quick decisions about what I'm working on, and when I make those decisions and I go, okay, I think the mix is done and I send it out and the client's like, wow. Or even if I take the mix out of the studio and put it on another system and it sounds better than in my studio, then that's great. That I mean, that's the win, yep. isn't it? Isn't that the opposite, I think, of what most people probably experience? Most people are like, get it amazing in their studio and then they take it out and they go, oh, there's too much sub or I'm missing some hundred or whatever. You know, it, I'd rather have the opposite of that and that, that should be the thing to aim for. Um, because again, as I said earlier, flat is not fun. It's It's... It's an accurate representation of the audio. That's that's you know if you can if you can stomach it and work on it, and a lot of people do, then you should get the situation where hopefully it will translate elsewhere. I'd rather have that than you know amazing pumping bass and you know huge wide high frequencies and everything like that, and then it just not work anywhere else. Because let's face it, am I going to invite the world to come and listen to our music in my studio? Yeah, sure. <laughs> I know. You know, we we want it to, to sound good everywhere else, don't we? Let's face yep, it. hundred percent. Right, so I suppose another thing to talk about as we talked about the three-way um, designs is obviously I've got, uh, Carly sent me fucking everything that they had. So I've got the Carly IN5s in here, which is a coaxial design. What are the advantages and disadvantages that you've found with coaxial designs? I think the the main reason there's probably two reasons I can think of that manufacturers don't generally you know they're not a widespread option are they? Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, the, the two reasons I think are one are producing coaxial designs and drivers are quite expensive, um, and number two, theoretically there should be a compromise on the on the driver design. Mm. And they may not perform as well as a standard driver. Um, again, that's, this is a generalisation. That's not necessarily always the case, and I think. The examples you've given there may have found some good ways around them, um, around those kind of flaws. But the thing to remember about coaxial designs is that they're addressing a problem from splitting the frequencies across multiple drivers. And that's mm-hmm. the, the the different locations of the drivers causing phase issues. So if you put those drivers all in one place, then the, the sound is all coming from one place. So more likely to be in phase, which is, as previously mentioned, 
I think it's more important than frequency response. No, I 100% agree. It's, That's why I look for in every speaker is good, fair, face coherence. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think that that's the thing I was saying that a manufacturer should make it clear what, what that actually is like because hmm. if your phase is more accurate, then you, you've got a much better... It's much easier to fix a frequency response in your room than it is to fix yeah. a phase issue. Mm-hmm. So um, especially if that phase issue is within the speaker. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, so I think, um, yeah, when it comes to coaxial design, I mean, they... they I think in many ways are better. You know, they, they're fixing those those fundamental issues in in many ways, which are good. Like you said earlier, Paul, with uh, we were talking about the low end frequency response, and, and we were talking about how omnidirectional the base can be. I've seen some coaxial designs in the past which have the kind of tweeter and mid range separately mounted in front of the woofer, which is kind of funky to me because the the being coaxially aligned with the woofer, which is you know, relatively kind of omnidirectional and less, you know, uh, kind of you know, subjective to those phase issues it seems a bit odd. Whereas, for example, Genelec have done quite a good job with that because the tweeter is right in the middle, surrounded yeah. by the mid range, yep. and then the woofers kind of evenly spread between the you know, above and below those. I really um, want to hear that, them. I've been, to, I've heard such good things about those. You, have you, did you tell me you've heard them, Ed? Those specific coaxial Genelecs, the the Genelec ones. Yeah, I think so. So they've got them at the Metropolis Studios, I believe. They're incredible for tracking on. I don't think I'd want to mix on them. I, I, Why? I, I'm interested. I'm interested. Is it because of the lispy thing that you say that Genelex almost like kind of DS naturally? That's what it sounds like to me. Yeah. yeah. And it's just fatiguing at the same time. It's. Um, this, I'd say that kind of sound is similar to the barefoot top end sound. Maybe I shouldn't be so mean on Genelec. It, it, yeah, it's it's not to my taste, but that's not to say it's not yeah, it's right for somebody. Them, yeah. As as we know, you know, I love the PSI top end. You hate it, so yeah. And I, th- and I think a good thing of talking about limitations is that you know the Genelecs cost a lot, lot more to, than the IN fives. Like Ed still still can't believe that you could pick up a coaxial three way for like five hundred quid. It's like crazy, but. You know, Nate from Cali, you know, if you see the measurements, it's there, it's in my measurements. I've spoken to Nate from Cali and he's, there is, I can't remember what they call it, it's a funny word, it's like a doubly do or whatever they call it, but it's basically like a, a boost and a dip or a dip and a boost around 12 kilohertz and 15 kilohertz and it's on every measurement. And he told me that that was a limitation of trying to build a coaxial design at that price bracket. And he said to me, we could have fixed it, but it was going to cost a lot more money to produce a coaxial three-way design that did not have that limitation. So again, it brings it up that point there that in every single design, there is a limitation of some form. It's and a compromise. There is no, there's never such a thing as a perfect speaker. And, you know, budget is always going to come a massive part of it. And that's why, again, we've spoke about many monitors in here that, you know, to make speakers that, you know, theoretically, you know, are many would people would class them as perfect. But, you know, if in terms of mixing, low distortion, you know, phase accurate, a very good transient response, you know, it costs a lot to be able to build that design and do that consistently, you know, over, you know, a global scale. Are there any other designs, Dale, that I can't, that I've not thinking about? So we've mentioned two ways, three ways, coaxial three ways, We've mentioned single driver, so again, like your autotones and the tantrum angry boxes that I'm getting sent at the end of the month, but which should be soon. Uh, are there any other designs that we've not mentioned? That there's, yeah, there are some others that that you don't really see um, on the market um, for various reasons, and mostly because they're quite hard to do or have other other limitations. But I was involved in a design of a speaker, which oh, never you? made it to market, but it was a project right. we were working on and uh, behind the scenes here. And um, we kind of we've we've got working speakers, and there are some out there. Actually, we did we sold a few pairs, um, but uh, we kind of realised that we didn't want to be a speaker manufacturer, so we stopped. It, it was a really powerful exercise for me to to go through and massively increase my understanding of monitoring, and also be- I became incredibly sympathetic to the speaker manufacturers and the pain <laughs> they have to go through when they're trying to balance, you know, customer demand competition, price, and you know, like all the things that, that are involved in it. It's, it's really, really difficult. Based on what I was saying earlier about a single speaker theoretically being the best, but obviously can't be yeah. the next best thing being two-way, I went for a two-way design, partly because also it's a lot easier to design than a, yeah. a three-way. 
you know, having two drivers mounted very close in a, in a cabinet is an easy way to get quite a good sound. We chose a quarter wave tube cabinet design, and that's going to be new words to a lot of people. Right. That is kind of, it is a ported cabinet, but the airflow inside primarily works like a sealed cabinet. So the, the driver is f- behind the driver inside the cabinet is firing into a compartment which has its own port which goes into another section of the, the cabinet, which then has the port on it. And it's a horrendously complex piece of math I to work to out so that you don't uh, create any distortion um, and ideally no port chuff. And we were getting to the point where we had no port chuff from a ported speaker. You still have to tune the ports, but it's it's kind of another way. It basically gives you a ported design and the benefits of a ported design, i.e. you can go pretty loud and, and get good uh, low end and high x max on your your drivers without getting distortion from the seal cabinet because of course when you're firing into this cabinet behind the driver that essentially gets overloaded with pressure and bleeds into the rest and comes out the port but until that happens it behaves quite a lot like a sealed cabinet so it's only at extreme volumes or extreme dynamics that you start to need the port um it's a it's a really mind bending design and um i kind of hate that we did it but also love that we did it because it was yeah, such a learning experience. curve uh, i see why manufacturers don't make that um, it <laughs> does have its own downsides as well because even like transmission line for example and, and kudos to pmc because they don't suffer any of these problems but that can be really bad as well you know, like any of these designs actually can all, can all be really really bad if implemented incorrectly um the good thing is there's so much science out there now and a lot of people who really know what they're doing and clever enough to that we don't really see that much these days that are particularly shocking. The real compromises these days come to making a speaker to a certain price point. You were going to mention the materials. Uh, materials. Yeah. yeah, so I'd say, like, obviously, a little bit of Cali's, you've got the paper. Um, with my edifiers, they've got an aluminium uh, woofer, low mid driver. Um, I've got a planar magnetic tweeter, which is very interesting, which I actually really love in the edifiers. Um, and again, you've got beryllium tweeters with, you know, the mums and the focals. You know, in terms of the materials, are there specific sim signatures or are there limitations to, you know, benefits and positives to using different materials in, in, your, in the speakers? Definitely. Um, I mean, I, I could probably tell with my eyes closed if a speaker's got silk tweeters or, or hard mm. tweeters. Um, I think probably most people with any experience of both of those would as well, like... And that comes down to the damping factor again. We're saying about how woofers take time to slow down after a large dynamic episode. Um, with tweeters, if you imagine a hard tweeter, any hard material is going to have a resonant frequency. So you can imagine, you know, there are, there are tweeters out there that have got frequency, uh, resonant frequencies of like 17, 18, 19, 20 kilohertz. With, for example, X Machina, the material they've chosen, resonant frequency is 33 kilohertz which is obviously well beyond what yeah. we can perceive, but they also filter their high-frequency output to 30 kilohertz anyway, so the, the tweeter isn't being even driven at that, that area. So they've got no resonant frequency with their hard dome tweeter, which is great. Silk dome tweeters naturally self-damp. They're made of silk. It's a soft material, so, so, so the, the resonant frequencies just get damped by the material. So you can see there's kind of the pros to the silk dome tweeter. Well, why doesn't everyone do that? Well, the answer is that hard dome tweeters tend to move quicker a bit like a sealed cabinet on a, on a woofer you know that they're, they're yeah if you ask a bit of silk to move it's going to kind of move like you know if you're flicking a sheet essentially obviously this happens in nanoseconds but um hard dome tweeter is going to move much more uniform and rigid and, and pistonic so theoretically i suppose you could say a hard dome tweeter should be better but there are pros and cons to both of those things you know if it, but this way again if a hard hard tweeter is implemented badly you're going to get horrible you know problems caused by resonant frequencies and probably distortions as well so which is what i think with the presonus eris that's what i think i hear because there's but again it's like a 200 fucking pound speaker so you know what i mean so it's They're like really a, good for the money yeah really good for the money again yeah. i've got the presonus eris eights but i do notice there's a coloration in the tweeter you know if i go from you know the the callies to the edifiers to the focals i can hear a coloration in there but what I do like about them, they do have a hard tweeter in there, or do they? Yeah, I think they do. Is the transient response. Now, I take it again when you're talking about the movement and the speed, that 
where I, am I right in saying that um, in theory, a soft dome tweeter isn't going to have as good a transient response as opposed to a hard tweeter because of the speed? Or is that bollocks what I've just said? I, I, I would say that's probably hard. It, it might be a bit unfair to tweeters because, I mean, yeah, I suppose if you were to drill down into the science, that a hard tweeter should be somewhat faster than a yeah, soft dome paper, tweeter. Yeah. But whether that's really audible to us humans or not is, is another thing. I, 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 I'm sure there's some science out there that would answer that question. But obviously they do have some sonic differences, so we can hear some differences. That, that's no question, but... I think the, it depends on the on the hard material as well. Like, you know, the whole problem speaker manufacturers have with any driver, not just tweeters, but any driver, is they need it to be as light as possible, but as stiff as possible. Because if it if it twists or yeah, distorts correct. in any way, then that results in distortion to your sound. The problem with yep. having something that's incredibly rigid is it usually is quite heavy. So yeah. we're always on the lookout for exotic materials of some kind that have the property of being incredibly light and incredibly stiff, which is why you see things like titanium tweeters a lot. Um, even ceramic can be in very, very thin sheets, very, very light and very, very stiff. I've even heard of diamond. Yeah, that's a mum one. That was the first time I heard well, that. And that was like yeah. last week. And yeah, what's yeah, Focal is a flax summon that the, 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 the Focal Shapes uses. Flax so uh, the Shapes use, uh, 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 I'm not sure if it is actually flax, but I know they've certainly seen that in the description. So yeah, they, yeah. they Focal are one of the few manufacturers that produce and actually manufacture their own drivers yeah. completely. Mm-hmm. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to the Focal factory, which actually, uh, it, one of the really cute things about it, and they say cute, they're an, it's an enormous place, <laughs> but um, all the woofers are made on the ground floor and then the tweeters, the floor above oh, the legs, um, really? which I think was quite cool. <laughs> and, and actually watching the tweeter manufacturing <laughs> process was fascinating because beryllium is a horrible material to handle and they're nuts yeah, to, to use it. Um, but well, it was banned, right, wasn't it? For yeah, many it was, years yeah. in the UK. I wasn't aware of that. It, it banned as <laughs> a toxic substance, yeah. Yeah, only at high temperatures, though. That's the thing. So, yeah. um, But if a driver's going and it can generate those high temperatures? Hey, if it's going to melt, I suppose it could, yeah. Um, I imagine uh, surely folk, folk have built some fail safes in for that. But I, I seeing that produced was mad because they'd show you a, a little kind of square like this big uh, of beryllium and it's a, the actual sheet is a quarter of a thickness of human hair. I, who's human hair? I don't know. Everyone's, I'm sure, is different, but <laughs> that's what they said. And they take it into a hermetically sealed room, wear like basically spacesuits, heat the piece of metal up to, a, I think it's something like 2000 degrees, and they just kind of stamp it into the shape of the tweeter that they have and then let it cool down and it's perfectly handleable. You know, I, I, I get a lot of fun out of trying to find and solve people's problems, you know. Yeah, I can same, imagine, yeah. When, when Ed showed me what was going on with him, I was like, oh, well, I want to get my teeth into this. This is. This is our challenge. I, I, I yeah, enjoy. It was, a, it was a rewarding day. I think it's, it's fun. I think what we've discussed in this episode and what we touched on with Yesco last week was diving into the science and the theory of room acoustics and the science and theory of speaker design is fascinating. And I think speaker design science, I think, goes a long way further than acu- room oh, acoustics. Yeah. But I'm sure there'll be those that disagree. Comment away on the YouTube video about that. But as Yesco said last week, it's very easy to get to the fringes of where science and reality meet and although Mm. you can analytically break down a speaker and think right that's the speaker for me that may that theory may go out the window depending on your room it also may go out the window depending on your hearing and last week we talked about tuning a system toning a system and our own tilt uh i the natural eq curve or tilt one way or the other higher or lower or you know mid-range or smiley face that we have and then which tilt or variation of that results in translation and i think what i've enjoyed most about getting to know speakers speakers are like my new obsession like you know sod drums i'm, I'm done with it's that addictive, I want <laughs> speakers are my, <laughs> my new thing um not so new thing and i just love the the variety the characteristics the details you know, uh, it is always a compromise. There is no perfect speaker. I mean, there is a brand out there who I think are close to creating the perfect speaker. Paul, I think you know who I'm talking about. Mid-range and top end. Incredible. Yep. If they could marry the low end with another brand, they'd just be the, the most unbeatable speaker, I think. Yeah. For me, it's just, it, I get so much enjoyment out of this, but ultimately, yeah, as you've said, Dale, they are tools and they need to work for you. So in my experience... For those listening, if you are looking at new speakers, 
start with a blank slate, get out of the idea of having a two-way or a three-way or this brand or that brand. Correct. Because you've yep. seen them in popular rooms. Speak to someone like Dale, uh, who does know his stuff, trust me from personal experience, and work out what your needs are. Work out with someone like him what will work for you in your room. And then if you can, get someone like Dale. You know, I will plug SX here that you guys do genuinely suggest taking speakers down into your own room. And, you know, I've had Jason round with my, the, the 120s when I bought those, that service blew, blew me away. Been a customer ever since. And then you've obviously come around recently with three sets of speakers, all of which were phenomenal. And you sold me the cheapest brand out of the lot, but it wasn't the price that was the, the factor. It was the fact that they measured best in my room. And they're also a brand that I knew that I was also getting translation success on. And to get to the awareness of translation success, I've had to change my tilt, my internal EQ tilt a little bit and just work on the tools that I've had. It took me a year, I think, to decide that the PSIs weren't doing it for me. I was blown away with them a year ago. Confirmation bias probably for most of that time. They are wonderful speakers in many ways, but they weren't translating in a way that I needed them to. Therefore, they were redundant. So, you know, what else is out there? Speak to the professionals who know what they're talking about. Brilliant. And let's not forget that we're also like pre-tuned in our heads as well, what we used to. Um, she did the thing I found from my experience is when we're putting speakers in front of people, they're more statistically likely to choose a pair of speakers that kind of already sound like what they've got. It's very difficult to totally change what you're used to. Yeah. And and then love it, you know, and then put thousands of pounds down potentially on it. So it's a painful thing to to try and go through. But you, you know, as I say, the sanity check is the measurements and and trust that. that yeah, that's yeah. there for a reason. Yeah. And impressive is not best. Yeah, totally. Not well, if you're a producer, it can be. You know, this is a yeah, thing. It's, it's a, yeah. it's a, it, this is again, it's contextual, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Let, yeah. Let, let's yeah, not, let's not yeah. forget that. This is, you know, if I'm a hobbyist and I just want to have fun making music, do I need the most perfect speakers in the world? Probably not. You know, um, do I need something that's that's nice and fun and reliable as well? Let's not forget that. Um, whereas if I'm a you know high end mastering engineer, I need something that's absolutely perfect as 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 far as we can go. Um, I, I, ideally, perfect in that room. You know, there's, there's, this, you can see why so many people get lost in this. You know, oh, when you put together yeah. how complex room acoustics is, how complex mm. speaker design is, you know, and every speaker manufacturer says their thing is the best. You know, everyone who's got <laughs> their pair of speakers that they've chosen thinks that's the best pair of speakers because obviously they bought them. And that might well be the best pair of speakers for that person. Let's not forget that as well. But so it's, a, it's just a big minefield. And that's why I say what I said at the beginning of this, get the speakers in your room and measure and, and just trust those things and then work with it. Um, because at the very least, you're going to learn something out of that and it's going to make you a better mixer in the long run. Yeah, and if you get a speaker into your room and it doesn't do what you want it to, that's okay. Try other brands, you know. And like I said, get Dale around to bring you three sets of speakers and you'll choose the best <laughs> ones that work for you. I, I was blown away the difference one set of speakers could make it. Didn't I remember when we had to measure problems, again. But- <laughs> Yeah, hey, I didn't believe you, did I? <laughs> I think I did the first measurement while you were out of the room and you were like, no, 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 that's not right. So we did the measurement again and then it, then it came out to be uh, definitely accurate. Uh, it's just luck though, you know, it, it's a bit of luck there because it, it just so happened that that pair of speakers, look, it doesn't matter what the brand was, right? If we put any pair of speakers and you've got that measurement there, it's going to be quite hard yeah. to convince you that yeah. that's probably not the pair of speakers you should be going for. So, yeah. so you live and learn, bit, sometimes it's extensively. Thin. <laughs> on that bombshell Dale that's been a fantastic episode guys listening guys girls ladies and thems if you've got something out of this episode please like subscribe and share the videos and if you can please give us a review on Apple podcast reviews that will help us grow this content and help us hopefully get this amazing content out to more and more people who will find this useful and hopefully save more people the two years of struggling that I've personally had on this journey and I know Paul's had his struggles as well because um there's a lot to learn here but that's the idea of this podcast to help you guys learn from our journeys and our experiences dale it's been a pleasure thank you so much for taking the time to do that it's been emotional from me i'll leave it to paul there we'll have it like subscribe do all the great things and we will see you next week